She's the Species Program Officer of the IUCN Regional Office in Oceania. And um, Yvonne Sadovi, who stepped out of the room for, oh, there's Yvonne. Sorry. Yvonne Sadovi is the co-chair of the Groupers and Grasses Specialist Group and the Marine Conservation Subcommittee of IUCN. And Nicola Stolby, who is at, in another session at the moment, will be joining us shortly. And he is the chair of the co-chair of the Sharks Specialist Group. So why are we here? Why are, is it important to evaluate trends of marine conserv of the status of marine species? What is this myth of ocean invincibility? So marine species have long been considered resilient to extinction because they are thought to be widely distributed all over the world and they're so numerous. And there's also been this long-standing um, idea, this notion that the oceans are just too vast and limitless for mankind to have a profound impact as a whole. This workshop intends to examine that myth of invincibility from the perspective of what we have learned so far of the likelihood of extinction of marine species over the last six years, particularly from the perspective of the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Specifically, we want to try to better understand what we can do with this newfound and valuable knowledge to better refine conservation priorities and effect on the ground conservation action at the local, regional, and global levels. But most importantly, we want this workshop to be a dialogue on how we can use this information um, to plan for the future. So um, we'll just give you a brief overview of the program this afternoon. So we have six presentations. Each will run for about 10 minutes. And we will probably have time for one or two questions after each talk. However, we want to have a dialogue um, for an hour after each of the presentations. So um, we ask you to please reserve any questions or comments after all the talks for the interest of time. So Ken Carpenter will begin the session with, um, and he will talk about the Global Marine Species Assessment. He will then be followed by Helen Pippard, who will talk about the um, red listing initiatives in Oceania. And then I will talk about a comprehensive um, red list data analysis in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And then Bruce will talk about the tunas and the billfishes, after which Yvonne will talk about the um, using red list assessments to advance marine conservation. And then she will be followed by Nick, who will talk about the activities of the shark specialist group. And then their last presentation will be by Kent, who will talk about how we should, how we can translate these results to conservation action on the ground. So without further delay, I'll let Kent take the stage. Okay, thank you, Mia, and thank you very much for proposing and uh, organizing this whole workshop. Mia has been uh, is responsible for uh, all of the all of the work that went behind getting everybody here. So, um, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a very brief overview of what uh, the Global Marine Species Assessment has done uh, since 2005 when we started this this initiative. Um, we are based at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we are the marine biodiversity unit of the species program, uh, of the IUCN species program. And we have a number of postdocs and graduate students and undergraduate students who are all helping us with the global marine species assessment. Uh oh, what did I just do? Uh -oh. oh, there we go. That, that works. Okay, so we have a very ambitious goal in, this, in the Global Marine Species Assessment, and that is to uh, significantly improve marine conservation capabilities at all scales, global, regional, and local scales. And the way we intend to do this is by significantly increasing the number of marine species that have been assessed under red list criteria. Now, this is necessary because as of fairly recently, very few species have been assessed, very few marine species have has been assessed uh, under red list criteria. Before 2000, uh, less than 1% of all the species on the red list had are, uh, are marine. And when we started doing our workshops in 2006, uh, around 2.5% 2 .2 of all the species assessed under red list criteria were marine. So very few compared to how many uh, uh, total species. 
So, and in fact, when we uh, first started in 2005, there was a, a textbook that came out called Marine Conservation Biology. This was by Norris and Crowder. And when they talked about the IUCN red list and marine species, they said, except for a minority of commercially fish species and some charismatic megavertebrates, the status of most marine organisms was and continues to be unknown. Okay. So why is this? Maybe it has something to do with the fact that it's more difficult to assess marine species under red list criteria, more difficult to observe them. Um, but perhaps it also has something to do with the fact that there was this sort of myth, myth of invincibility of the oceans. And this probably has to do with the idea that marine species, because they're so widespread, uh, because the ocean is essentially limitless, are probably more resilient to threat. Okay, and this is what we wanted to, to address. Um, unfortunately, it appears as if this myth even goes, is continued on to this very day. Just a couple of weeks ago, in a very influential paper in Nature, I'd like to quote the authors who said, biodiversity scores may seem surprisingly high, but this result accurately reflects uh, that relatively few known marine species risk extinction. So this was an unfortunate remark that came out just a couple of weeks ago. So the myth continues. All right, so uh, back in 2005, there was an initiative, the Global Marine Species Assessment, which was uh, aimed at redressing the imbalance of terrestrial species on the IUCN Red List. And this was um, uh, an initiative that was put together by the IUCN, the Species Survival uh, Commission, uh, the species program of the IUCN, um, and also a partnership with Conservation International, and we're headquartered at Old Dominion University. And I'd like to say that in 2009, the GMSA was formally um, uh, uh, created, well, was formalized as the Marine Biodiversity Unit of the IUCN Global Species Program. So our strategy for the GMSA was really in two parts. One. Uh, we got together with uh, the brightest minds in, in uh, marine conservation biology. A couple of them are, uh, are here. Yvonne, well, Nick is coming a little bit later, but we met uh, to try to come up with a strategy for the GMSA. And one of these was to try to complete at least 20,000 species. Okay? And the idea here is that we would get uh, a, a more or less adequate uh, representation of marine species. We also wanted to make sure that we co created complete clades. And the reason that we want to compete, complete, create, uh, complete grade, yeah, clades, sorry, yeah. after lunch here, <laughs> a little bit, like, a little bit uh, it's the last day of the, the forum, so on and so forth. The sun's in my eyes, the grass is slippery. But um, uh, the, the reason that we want to complete, uh, do complete clades is because, uh, as you know, not every species on the red list is threatened, okay? There's a very important group of species that are on the red list. These are the least concerned ones. And if you do a whole clay, then you can get an idea of the proportion of both least concerned and those that are threatened. And this is very important if you want to monitor the progress of whether or not we're winning or losing the battle for biodiversity conservation over time. So uh, during this strategy workshop, we got together and decided, well, if we're going to do 20,000 species, which 20,000 species are we going to do? You have to choose among at least 250,000 known marine metasomes. The estimates are that there are probably a couple of million marine species out there. At least some estimates put us up there. And we figured that at least we could complete all of the vertebrates. And we also thought very hard about which, which of these vertebrates to start with. These were mostly fishes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But in addition to um, completing mostly the fishes, um, we also decided that we were going to complete uh, the, ha the so-called habitat forming primary producers. This includes the corals, the seagrasses, the mangroves, and uh, the reef building, uh, and also a selected macroalgae, the, the kelps primarily. We also wanted to complete some representative invertebrates. And of course, in order to complete all the sea snake, all the vertebrates, we also had to complete the sea snakes because the marine mammals, the turtles, and the seabirds had already been done by uh, specialist groups. So the second part of our strategy was to use the workshop setting. 
uh, the old style of doing red list assessments was by mail and uh, by contact groups that were very small. Uh, what we wanted to do was to try to get through as many species as possible, and the way we did this was by fundraising so that we could get scientists together in the workshop setting. So what have we done? We completed since, essentially, we started our workshops in 2006. In 2006, we actually spent more time fundraising for species specialist groups and, and, and collaborating with species spe specialist groups on completing uh, workshops. But since 2006, we've completed 50 workshops um, and we've engaged 523 experts from 53 countries and 311 institutions. So we've been very busy since 2006. We've completed nearly 11,000 assessments and these come from a wide variety of claves that we have completed already. Not all of these are on the red list yet, but we've got, we've got a lot done so far. Um, we have also, um, okay, so for some reason this is not advancing. Can you press the page down? It has something to do with the way this thing was set up. I don't have a computer here, do I? Maybe I can do something like this. Let's try this one here. Oh, there we go. Okay, I got it. So um, we've also been looking at this in different regions. So in some cases, uh, for example, Conservation International had an interest in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. So we completed all of the marine species, all the GMSA species in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Mia is going to be talking to you about that in a minute. Um, we completed all the Mediterranean species and we're working on Oceania, Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, the Coral Triangle, West Africa. And I should also uh, mention that we're, we just agreed to do the European fishes as well. One of the main things that we wanted to do when we started the GMSA was to create species specialist groups. So there's species specialist groups for marine mammals, for seabirds, uh, for turtles, for sharks and rays, for groupers and wrasses. But um, we, uh, along the way, also created species specialist groups so that the information that's in the red list can get translated to more uh, conservation action on the ground. So we created a coral species specialist group. Um, uh, Bruce will talk to us about the tuna and billfishes. We also have an, an SSG, SG, the snappers, sea greens, and uh, grunts species specialist group, and so on. So um, we have uh, got over uh, nearly 11,000 species completed, <coughs> assessments completed so far. Not all of these are on the red list yet. There are uh, many that are still in the pipeline that are being done, uh, uh, finalized. Um, but uh, the, the good news is, is that we've started <coughs> to redress this imbalance. So initially there was two and a half percent of the species on the red list were marine. We've uh, weaved our way up to 8% 8, 8 and this is at a time when many additional assessments were being put on. A lot of new terrestrial species were being put on, the amphibians, the mammals, and so on and so forth. So, but we've been uh, slowly increasing the percentage of marine species. Some of our general findings are, uh, this shouldn't be a su surprise to anybody, exploitation is by far uh, the most pervasive threat to marine species. Bruce will talk to us a little bit more about that. We also are, find, also are finding that habitat specialists and the restricted range endemics are also typically at risk. In terms of the habitat forming species, we've completed all of them uh, except for the kelps, the reef building corals, the major threats are climate change and localized threats. Seagrasses, primarily coastal development and pollution, and mangroves also uh, coastal development and exploitation for a variety of different purposes. So uh, this gives you the proportion of least concerned, data deficient, and, and um, threatened species of all the different groups that we've assessed so far. I won't go over this in detail. This is just to show that there's a very wide range of threat, proportion of threatened species in the different groups that we have been looking at. So um, for example, um, uh, Acanthuridae, the surgeon fishes have very few threatened species. Um, groupers have uh, quite a few threatened species. 
And a lot of this has to do with the proportion of uh, uh, the different threats. Okay, so overall, if you take a midpoint, and this is a midpoint estimate of how many threatened species there are in the marine realm, our estimate is, is that there's somewhere around 21% of marine species. Okay, so of all the groups that we've looked at so far, if you average this over all of them, then 21% are threatened. Now, uh, I don't know what happened here. There we go. I hope I want to go back again. But if I can, let's just see. Okay, so 21%, what does that mean? Well, if you look at how many air-breathing terrestrial vertebrates are at risk, it's right around 20%. <coughs> If you look at how many terrestrial invertebrates that are threatened, it's right around 20%. If you look at marine invertebrates separately, it's about 20%. Um, if you look at plants, the estimate from the sample red list index is about 26%. So this shows us, uh, without any shadow of a doubt, that, that marine species are in fact no less um, at risk of extinction than terrestrial species. So this myth of, myth of invincibility is resoundingly um, wrong. So what are our plans for the future? Um, we plan to complete a number of different areas. We're working in West Africa. We're working in completing the Caribbean this year, uh, Oceania as well. We hope to have all of the bony fishes completed for Oceania. The Arabian Peninsula we're starting to work on. We have a, uh, um, a collaboration with the Qatar National Research Foundation. Um, and we're also going to start working on the European assessments. So we have about 10,000 more species to go. And we hope to continue to train.